Recorded at the studios of Chicago Public Media, WBEZ, this is Stages to Success. The drive to excel is universal, as is the pride in a job well done. Whether you're staring down a decision maker for a multi-million dollar contract, a television camera or microphone, a negotiating adversary, or an irate conductor, the pressure to perform can be exhilarating and exhausting. Join me and meet great storytellers from music and business. Stages to Success is brought to you by NICAR, the Northern Illinois Commercial Association of Realtors. Today's guest is a true niche specialist in the world of commercial real estate. Ray Volk of Jenkins and Huntington serves as a vendor to the most sophisticated architects and developers in the world and to small landlords. He designs and consults on optimal elevator systems from Gene Gang design buildings in Chicago, super tall projects in Dubai, to two-story investor landlords and repurposed buildings. We began our interview speaking of the overlap of my careers and how Ray stepped into both of those worlds. We met kind of like in an interesting overlap of my careers because I I taught your son clarinet. Right, and Gene Piper had just left, and that was Andrew's teacher before you, and went to Arizona to live. And... uh, we just got talking, and it was really funny because it was like, you know, we were looking for a Clarinet teacher, teacher right? and, and you were there, and you just showed up out of the blue. So I'm thinking, oh, you know, <sighs> I just moved here. I'm just trying to freelance. I taught for 25 years. I, you know, I, I need to think about this. You know, then, at, you know, at that point, I was a teaching at DePaul University, I think. Right. And, and um, I was fully invested in the music career. And and now, uh, you're one of my you're on my vendor list because frankly I don't know anybody that does what you do for a living. I, I remember when your son I, I asked about you, and your son told me what you did having to do with elevators and 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 I thought oh like Otis elevator you know that's what stuck in my mind and I just plugged it away. Then I moved back to New York and I start working for a development company. And of course, the elevator vendor contract is a huge part of our life, the escalator, elevator people. So then when we moved back here, I remember thinking, oh, you know, Ray is one of those guys with the tool belts and grease and knows everything in the world about, he doesn't seem like one of those mechanical Joe kind of guys. And then I found out what you really did. And, and, and you truly are the only person I know that does what you do for a living. I know you know plenty of other people. That's right. <laughs> but in our, and, and that's why I thought about it for the podcast, because in our industry, in commercial real estate, we, the brokers tend to get so focused in on the transaction that we can easily lose sight of all the moving parts that go into the, the perfect lease or the perfect lease location until something huge happens that the client brings to your attention and says, you know, for this data center, we need the ability to have uh, N++. We need Tier 4. Uh, we need 99.9% business continuance. And all of a sudden, you have to become not an expert, but you have to become fluent in their terminology. And with what you do, I'm amazed how often it comes up from the development side especially. But even with, even with the the tenant side of the equation. That we want to be in this elevator bank. We want to be in a kind of building that does have these functions, doesn't have these. Uh, tell me, I just want to rewind it way back. You're, you're working in this very particular hyper-specialized field. Were you fascinated as a kid by how things work? Were you like my brothers that had an erector set and you made a little engine that made the elevator go up? Is that kind of part and parcel of your personality? 
I actually grew up on a dairy farm in Iowa. Oh, you're my third person uh, guest uh, from dairy farms. Okay, but dairy farmers' kids work with erector sets too. I mean, what? What? You what, have what, to fix everything when you're a farmer. Okay, things break. You don't call in a specialist. I mean, you're the specialist. Yeah. When it gets a little too difficult, you call someone in. But when we would go to the big city of Dubuque, and where it was a uh, what really caught my fascination early on was the escalators at the Roshek department store. Where do the steps go? Yeah. When they turn around, something happens to them. And I would just sit there and watch them and ride them all day long. So your dad was the farmer. You're just a kid. Was he a Mr. Fix-It? Was he, did he have his hands in everything on the farm and you watched him or maybe helped him? Everything. So you had to repair everything. You had to know how to fix everything. And what, what, um, was there one project that, that caught your eye, like you fixed a milking machine? I don't know what, that you, you said, oh, that was fun, I'm good at this. The crazy thing that I really enjoyed doing was a, a old John Deere hand crank corn sheller. Okay. Where you would just get this, this big flywheel going, and then you would just start throwing the ears of corn in there, and the corn would come out into the bucket below, and the corn cobs would shoot out the other end. And I could do that for hours and just do the mechanicals mechanical portion of that just fascinated me. How but, it's this could pure, but it's purely mechanical. It's got no electricity, no nope. power. Nothing. Amazing. And and uh, I know that probably the ancient Egyptians moved elevators this way, <laughs> but it's probably not super applicable to, your, to your, your expertise. Was there something that you got your hands on that was quite technical and you were either stymied by it and thought, I want to learn how to do this, darn it, or... I think what really happened was the opportunities presented in college after I had changed from wanting to be an architect into realizing that I wasn't very good at drawing things. And I actually had a wonderful teacher that, that took the time to say, you know what, you're really not this good at this, <laughs> mm -hmm. and you should think about doing something else. So uh, I was taken aback at first, but then yes, I think you're right, and I got a business degree in marketing, And but I had a, a company come that was in interviewing on campus and they were looking for someone that had a either a marketing management or architecture background and I basically had all three I said I think I'll give this a shot and I interviewed with them and just the whole thought of it and I, I had spent some time you know writing the elevators in our dorm and I was always interested in how they worked and things and and, and the mechanic would, would sometimes have the doors open and I'd peek in and see what was going on so that's probably my first experience really with looking at the mechanics of you know, people riding elevators on the farm. Of course, we had grain hauling elevators mm -hmm. and a whole different animal. And uh, I ended up getting a job right out of college working for uh, Schindler Elevator, Schindler Houghton. The Houghton Elevator was out of Toledo, Ohio, and they'd just been bought by Schindler. And I started in 1979 in the elevator business as a salesman. We had no idea where we were going to go work. There were five of us that were brought in. And we were going through training and learning about the different technologies and such available in 1979 and what our product lines were. And we would all sit around and figure out who was going to go to what towns. And I really wanted to get back to, you know, the Midwest and Chicago. And, and luckily, that's where I was uh, placed. I would never have guessed that your entrance into the industry was through sales, Ray. Never. I would have expected that you were a mechanical engineer that was hired to fix problems and came in the tech door. You walked in the sales door. That's correct. But we were entitled sales engineers back then because we had to do the basic engineering. Mm -hmm. We would have to figure out, you know, we would be asked by architects before there were a lot of elevator consultants like myself. Now running around back then, the architects would call us up and say, how many elevators do I need? How big do they need to be? How fast do they need to be? And of course, we had to run, you know, calculations, you know, longhand by, and and this was right at the time when calculators were just starting to come around. So we were using those and figuring out, you know, how long it takes to get an elevator to come get you, and, and would work with all the different architects and uh, help, of course, lay out and specify things that our company was the most competitive at selling. And that was one of the problems with using an elevator salesman for your engineering was that you had a hidden agenda. Well, you got, I mean, you, you got to back up and, and prove to me that it's not some dirty little secret that the people in the tallest buildings in the world had their elevators designed by a salesman. Right? Where did you get the expertise to make the calculations, to have the engineering savvy? Where did that come in, in college or? 
there was a book that was written back in the 60s, and that became the Bible for just about everybody in the elevator business. It's called? Uh, Vertical Transportation by George Strakosh. And, and it was pretty much laid all the parameters. Here's how you run these calculations. Uh-huh. And the, the, the probability of stops and things is not a new concept. That started back in the 1920s. If you have 14 people on an elevator making 18 stops, p- potentially you're going to stop at 7.6 different floors. And I'm just making these numbers yeah, right, up. But, right. but, but that, that probability came out in the 1920s. So he kind of used that concept and, and took it to... Uh, how long it takes for the doors to open and close. And there's, there was a whole long formula you ran through. So you're dealing more with, it sounds like you're dealing more with statistics than physics. Yes. Do you Physics have, are very involved. Do you so. have a physics guy just in case that 35th person gets on the elevator designed for 30? I mean, what, what, what's the job overlap at your company there? We have engineers. We have uh, designers. We have Mostly just people that were in the elevator business that are, are now dealing with experience to say, okay, this works and this doesn't work. Okay. We have a computer program that was developed, boy, by uh, Jenkins from Canada back, Keith Jenkins, in, in the 1960s using NCR punch cards and, and such to, that he actually came up with a simulator. And then when Kevin Huntington, my partner, got involved with, with Keith, it was part of the deal when when we broke away. Was that hey, we get that same, we get that algorithm, we get to work with it, and and it be, went from NCR punch cards to uh, o- Lotus one two three uh, software, and now it's a Windows based system. But and over the years, we've formulated different and met with different elevator companies to understand their algorithms and how they answer calls. So mm-hmm. now we can pretty much set up any building. It takes me about you know a day to model a 50-story office building, and then I'll run the different banks of elevators and figure out what we need to do. And you're, um, the, you're, the, the company you now work for, Jenkins and Huntington, is, is created around these two individuals you're talking about. Right. And, and Keith Jenkins kind of became a very small part of our, industry, our, our business here in Chicago and, and in New York and, and USA because he was really the, the largest in Canada, and he had met mm-hmm. Kevin working on a on the CN Tower and, and said, boy, I need a, a USA partner. And the Canadian market went to the, went to heck. And then Kevin kind of was doing all the work and collecting not there's enough of the money. And he said, I think I'm going to buy this business out for the USA. And that's, although we keep the Jenkins name, Keith is not really involved much and at, in, all, for, at all, actually. Yeah, well, for my uh, uh, non-business listen, listeners, the uh, the acronym NCR, National Cash Register. Yes. So you're... <laughs> You're calculating these things maybe like Goldie Miller talked about with the uh, old kind of calculating device. The uh... Oh, it was an old, you know, you, you did punch cards like we did in college back in our, in our era mm-hmm. when we were working doing, doing uh, uh, regression analysis and things like that. Where you actually punched in the, that was, I would, by the time I came on board, of course, we were on the, we were on the Lotus 1, 2, 3 version. So right. At least ah. it was, was computer input. Yeah, it's amazing. Um. So you're back, you're with, let's say, a smaller elevator company working as an expert salesman. And what kind of projects were you pitching there? A, th- a three-story elevator inside an apartment building? What, what, was your, what were your first assignments as a 20-something working for this company? I was working right out of the box. The first job I sold was Three O'Hare Towers, which was right by uh, the Romantic Golub job, right by the airport there. Okay. And we had just changed to the Illinois accessibility standards, so we had to learn different code issues and things along And that, that was line. your first project? That was the first project I worked on. How many stories in that complex? There were uh, three 12-story buildings. Yeah. Right. Four elevators. That's, uh, that's a big project to hand to a young guy. I got to meet a lot of great people. Uh, Romantic and Gala back then was Bill Moody was there and uh, and uh, Bill Abrams. There was a lot of really good people in, in that organization. And that's right as the market around O'Hare Airport for our national listeners uh, really exploded. It sure did. Because the airline industry now started to drive office occupancy, now started to drive hotel occupancy, which it always had to a certain extent. But then it, it became a hub. Right. Um, and even my, my brother's um, medical organization moved to headquarters out there because national and international people coming 
wanted to be at conferences that are close to where they're flying in. And that's true today all through uh, the professional organizations, the 501c4s, that if they meet nationally, they're out by O'Hare. And that's, that's, that's very interesting. And you can pretty well fly every, anywhere in the world one stop, you know, nonstop kind of a situation. Um, so that's... Yeah, you and I, um, you and I talked uh, at at church about um, the Chicago Spire project that you got hired to work on and conceptually design, and I believe you got paid for. Right? Yes, uh, but it never came out of the ground, and and I think people that uh, are not from the commercial real estate industry would be shocked at how many conceptuals are drawn, how many development programs even hit the newspaper like that one did, or are uh, floated to the highest level with vendors actually providing services for them and being paid that never go up. I, I think people would be shocked by that. And that's the that's the uh, the sunk cost that really harms developers can put them out of business. In your case, is there another one like this this Chicago Spire project that Ray Volk was in, was hired to work on? You thought it was really neat, and boy, I'd love to see that up and running someday. I'm really proud of that project, but it never got off the ground. Is there another one like the Spire? There is another one, but I want to talk a little bit about the Spire first. Sure. Just the first iteration of the Spire that Chris Carley came up with from Fordham Development, and Chris is unfortunately no longer with us, but was a great man. Uh, it was beautiful. Uh, Santiago Calatrava, this beautiful th slender, which made it for a very difficult engineering concept. Yeah. We had to try and jam a lot into a small amount of space, and there's no really way to put a construction hoist on the outside because it, you know, it tapered. So we were working, and one of my classmates, Kevin Dieball, was working with Chris at the time, and we were looking and scratching our heads, how do we actually build this thing? And, and we kind of had it down to how we were going to build it, but the market didn't do so hot. So we, it, it got delayed, but it had two good elements. It had a hotel element for, for immediate revenues, and it had uh, then the, the, the high-end condominiums at the top, and a broadcast tower because it was so tall at the yes. very top portion of the building. Yeah, and we were just at Calatrava's Art Museum, uh, my wife and I, uh, last weekend in Milwaukee, and he, he's, he's visionary uh, really in, in the sense that, uh, I mean, he's got to be one of the top three, four people in the world with his concepts, whether it's public municipal transportation or uh, art museums or, or buildings. Did you get to pitch your expertise to Related Midwest when they bought the site and say, I did this already, and, and, and this would be a piece of cake? <laughs> I do a lot of related work. Okay. <laughs> already, both here and then, and Kevin does a lot in Manhattan as well. So yeah. They're a very good customer. They're, they're a delight to work with. Right. And the original iteration of them here in, in Chicago was LR Development, and, and what, a, what, a, what a fine organization that was as mm -hmm. well. So I've been working with that group for a good, I don't want to say it, but all, close to 30 years now. Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, well, let's but the other project... Yeah, the other project, project. Let's get to that other project. There was going to be a, like a CN Tower in Chicago on Northerly Island that never got built. It was after 9-11, of course, and the, the, the island got cleared, and there was going to be a close to 2,000-foot-tall tower wow. built on there. And Jim Getch designed it. was just beautiful. Uh, to get access, you parked over by uh, Soldier Field, and you took a tunnel underneath yeah. where all the boats were docked to get over there. And I mean, it was just really a, a cool project. I think it had a lot to, of it riding on the fact that we would get the Olympics, which we did not get. I worked hard on that, oh, too. That's, and had it, it would have really replaced then the lost Spire Tower because we would now have something else to at least look at that was very tall. Right. But that didn't happen either, unfortunately. I see a parallel to uh, my music business and you in the in your relationship to these, I'll call them star architects. That, that's the term that gets thrown around. Somebody like Getch, somebody like Gensler, somebody like Kali Traba, they appeal to you, don't they? And it, it'd be maybe because it was your first major. 
Yes, and, and Jim's an Iowa boy, too. So uh, yeah. To and keep that in consideration. And as a cog in a symphony orchestra, we would get, we would get very interested in, in the big conductors, what they were doing. Um, you know, are they, uh, are they going with this job? Are they going to this symphony? What, what, uh, what are they recording these days? It's, it, they're kind of in the uh, Mount Olympus range while you're, you're helping them build the pyramids at the, at the workplace. That's right. Um, did, um, uh, I had a question for you because I was, I was in an elevator recently that was so beautiful. It was the 35 East Wacker Jewelers Building, uh, almost like a single person elevator. They called it the birdcage elevator. And it was the only point of access up to the, the extreme the yes. setback where the, the client was looking at uh, the full floor, which was only 2,900 usable square feet, I think. And I thought it was just the prettiest thing I've ever seen. Uh, is there one for you? Is there an elevator that sticks out to your mind that, like, aesthetically, this, I would bring people from out of town to see this and show it off. Well, let's do a little tour of Chicago's fancy elevators. Okay. When I first started in the business, we would always take people for the 25 cent tour. We would go to Water Tower Place and just sit there and ride the escalators up with the waterfall going between yes, the two. Yes, that's and pretty. Then, and then sit and watch the three keyhole elevators going up and down the glass backed keyhole Oh, okay. Elevators. The glass ones, yeah. And they've got, uh, and then to look at it and figure out, well, where's the counterweight? How does this thing work? And just to sit there and... So Only that, you would be thinking that, by the oh, way. I know. I, I need a real <laughs> Only hobby. a nerd. I understand. <laughs> Time goes on, goes on. One of the things I worked at, I worked for Mitsubishi Elevators. It makes very good equipment, and, and, and not that I'm plugging them, but it's, it's, it was a delight working for them. And that's where I met, really, Jim Getch, and where I met Kevin Huntington that made all this happen. So God just puts things in our path, and, and they lead to other things. Um, the Blue Cross Blue Shield building, if you've never been in there, is just artistry in motion. If you really? watch those elevators, they are all glass elevators and that they're you can't see out of them because you can. There's like a, a pain tolerance for people where you can only go so fast with glass type elevators, or you'll start to get nauseated. Really? Yes, because motion sickness. Interesting. Yeah. So we had to make them opaque, and, and Jim put like lights underneath the cars too, so you can stand there outside, like you're standing over at the Aqua and on the balcony there and looking up. You can see, you know, the elevators going up and down in Blue Cross, but you can stick a nickel on edge and go 1,400 foot per minute, which is very fast, and the nickel does not fall down. Oh, that is a great, yeah. that is a great uh, illustration. And, and to explain some of your terms, the Aqua is Jean Gang's award-winning building. Yeah. She is, uh, uh, has won a MacArthur Foundation Award, a, a true star architect. And, and a great person, okay. just a fun person awesome. to be around, and, and a great employer. Her her, her her team's fun to work with as well. And the, the the Blue Cross Blue Shield building, it would be interesting to anybody um, from development. It was originally thirty three stories. It was built to double in height because it's at sixty six yeah. now. We designed it originally for Kevin when okay. he was working with Jim. Or, or right, designed it originally for for doubling in size. Okay, even that to to get a building that can go from thirty three to 66 stories for load bearing is phenomenal. It's Throw on top of that, building that while there are 5,000 people working daily in there right. processing insurance claims. Right, and, and, and you doing don't what they do. Right, and you don't have them exit the building while they do it. Right, it, it's it, it's it's kind of a a miracle. But now let's keep the tour going. One of my favorite looking elevators is at the Prada store. Really, over on Oak okay. and, and and Rush. So take a trip over there and get. Carrying a new purse, and okay. Help pay for that beautiful <laughs> elevator. Is the um, is besides the beauty of them, is there a project that you were involved in, maybe for, maybe for the engineering challenge, maybe for the this can't be done, maybe for the fact that it took so long to get done? Is there is there a favorite project that you look back on with pride that we got this one done? I think the biggest challenge, I would say this is a big challenge, was when uh, the John Buck Company came to us and doing the Roosevelt University expansion program there, the Wabash Street, and we had to have a residence on top of a classroom facility and not take up all the floor space with elevators. So mm. we had kind of some dual-purpose elevators to to meet the academic needs of moving personnel into classes and such, and then finally to put the residents onto their 
transfer floor on 14 to get to their beautiful residences upstairs. So mm-hmm. That was trying to squeeze the most into a small amount of, of footprint. And we ran the simulations, and I'm keeping looking at them going, boy, I sure hope this works. And, and, I've, and I've gone back and, and have sat and watched and have talked to people, and it, it just, uh, our simulator was absolutely correct. It handled the people. So that's neat. And John Buck, fun. if there were a Stark Architect word for developer, he'd he'd be our one in the uh, in Chicago office here now. I um, I had seen a picture, Ray, of uh, I think it was either from Japan or New York City or maybe both of an elevator that stopped at multiple floors at once or at, at least two floors at once, where people were getting on on floor. One and floor two, or but and so the the doors were opening in order to move a large amount of people. And conceptually, I couldn't figure that out. Can you help me think through how one of those works? Okay, we we had three of those in Chicago. We're down to two now, two buildings with that. The first really was the uh, Standard Oil Building, now the Aon Center. Right. The problem with that, I mean, it's it's a good problem. It, it solved the problem. How do you move a lot of people without taking up a f- large footprint? So you have two loading areas. But every floor-to-floor height in the building has to be the same. Okay. It can never vary. That's I one, one of the so. issues. And when, when, when things settle and such, we, we work around that. It's also very annoying at that building, it was before the elevators were modernized, is that you would stop on the 38th floor while you're unloading on 39. And your doors don't open, but a little voice comes on and, and says, you know, please wait while we, the other deck exits people. Okay, so I get it. You don't really, they don't, both doors don't really open up as long as that button wasn't pushed. That's correct. That's correct. It's important that you have that flexibility to move that large amount of people, but that's just during the peak period, which are the morning getting to work, lunchtime when everyone's going up and down, and uh, the last is everyone's running out the door. Mm -hmm. And during the off hours over at, the Aon Center now, um, they've been modernized such that only one elevator really opens and closes. So you don't, you're not making those false stops now. Right. And you can do that. And I, I remember when I um, first started working in real estate in New York, being assigned to go with the elevator computer technician up to the tower uh, mechanical area of our building. And just hearing him talk through, uh, you know, I think some of the problem you guys are having with workflow is where the elevators lay idle and la di da da Now, that's nothing to you. That's daily. That's just daily strategy that probably feels like nothing. But to me, it was eye-opening that the computer would decide uh, the elevator really should come to rest in the middle of the building during these periods of time and not go all the way down to the bottom floor. Um, but... I don't want to teach our listeners about that. Is there one little nugget like your nickel that moves 1,400 feet and doesn't fall over? Uh, it, is there one little nugget like that about elevator programming that might really surprise people that are on their daily commute up to the top of a tall building? What has changed now is the advent of what we call destination entry. And now it's becoming very, very commonplace in Chicago where you, instead of pushing an up and down button, you, you tell the elevator which floor you're going to go to. Right. And, it, and it puts you on with other people that are traveling to that same floor or in the same basic vicinity. And that helps you get to your destination quicker. But you might not necessarily get on the first elevator that shows up. So for the people that haven't been in one of these smart elevator buildings, you go into the lobby, you press in the floor into uh, almost like a directory as you go in and it says go to elevator H. Right. And you go over to Elevator H, and you don't get a choice in there. There's no Christmas tree of, of uh, buttons like Buddy the Elf pushed. You, It's just going to take take you where you're going to go. I, My problem is this, Ray. Before I knew these kinds of buildings, I had a meeting on the 19th floor in that building with a client, and an elevator's coming down, and I see somebody walking into the elevator, because, and because we're so conditioned— I followed her into the elevator and looked for floor one to press to go down. But she was, not only was, it, it wasn't going in the wrong direction as sometimes would happen. It was going down, but it went to a different floor that she had pre-programmed it for. And I just sat around there and waited and thought, now how do I do this? Get out of the elevator and push another button. And reprogram, <laughs> right. 
Welcome to Stages to Success, highlighting individuals who have helped shape our industry in the Chicago area. My name is Chris Schramko, President of the Northern Illinois Commercial Association of Realtors. On behalf of our association, we are proud to sponsor this podcast series. NICAR provides valuable tools, resources, education, and networking to commercial real estate practitioners throughout the state of Illinois. To learn more about NICAR and the many benefits we offer our members, please visit our website, NICAR.com. Thank you. Stages to Success can be found on TuneIn Radio, Google Play, iTunes, or our RSS feed. The link can be found at www.stagestosuccesspodcast.com. Try telling your Amazon Echo, Alexa, to play it by commanding, Alexa, play Stages to Success podcast. We're listening to an interview with Ray Volk of Jenkins & Huntington, elevator consultant to the stars. The, the other thing you and I talked about um, were these, it, it, and you've worked quite a bit in the Middle East, it sounds like, Dubai and, um, and these markets where we may see some of the tallest buildings ever built. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the trade rags of talking about buildings that could be a mile high. You were explaining to me that, that the thing that prevented this over the years wasn't necessarily the structural integrity, the wind, any of that stuff. It was the composition of the cable for that elevator. And I nice. read about it in an article, and I'm wondering if you can expound on it because frankly I've already forgotten what the <laughs> particulars were that made this cable and the weight of that cable the limiting factor on super tall buildings. Yeah, it's it's traditional steel wire ropes can on, can only really uh, accommodate a travel distance from the bottom landing to the top landing somewhere between 1700 and 2000 feet. Right? Because? Well, it just falls apart. It starts to get brittle and just vibration and there's a lot of elements within there that just you have to replace it too often for it to work well. So you now Kevin Huntington then we were talking we did just about every elevator company saying you know what you really got to think about is using a carbon fiber technology because that will get us past that and some went yeah 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 but Kone said okay we'll give it a shot and now they've got the carbon fiber rope technology. And who are they, a vendor to you guys, or are they a, a They're elevator an elevator company. company. I worked for them at one point in my life. They're okay. from Finland. They're the, they consider themselves the Japanese of the North. They're very uh, engineering intense. They've uh, tested it, and our first jobs in the United States will be projects I'm working on for at 110 North Wacker for Howard Hughes. They're going to have that in the, in the high rise and in, as well as in the uh, service elevators, not necessarily because of the height. Uh, but mostly for the fact that it's it's a better, longer-lasting technology to use. So you don't have to change the ropes as often. Or the, the suspension means, we call them now, because they're not really ropes. They're more like, like steel belts. Besides the, 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 the strength and the endurance of, of these uh, carbon fiber uh, technologies, is there also a weight? I Absolutely. thought I remembered reading oh, that yes. the, old, the old system, the, the cables became so heavy that they were self-limiting. Talk about the what is the weight and what is that, how are we working against gravity to, mm -hmm. uh, and how are we working with gravity now maybe with the new technology? All right, we're going to get on really a boring subject, but for me it's exciting. Into the weeds. <laughs> it's all right. You calculate loads on machinery based on, of course, the cab that you're riding on. That's got a weight. Yes, and what we want to try and do is counterbalance it so the elevator machine doesn't work so hard. So you've got the weight of the elevator cab. You've got the weight of the people that get on the cab. We have a structure on the other side that weighs about the same. Now, the problem is when you've got a 1,500-foot story building and the elevator's at the bottom and the counterweight's at the top, you've got 1,500 feet of hoist rope. So you've got to have that same amount of weight underneath the car going to the side of the counterweight. To, and that's called compensation, to compensate for the weight of that cable on the other side. What the carbon fiber does is it helps uh, alum, uh, reduce that significantly. So now the suspended load on the machine is, is smaller as, as, as well, so the machinery doesn't have to be as big and bulky. The horsepower still remains about the same to drive it because we're still uh, uh, driving a you know, fixed weight of, of people and a, and a counterweight on the other side. But now it's, it's less, so it has to work a little bit less than it would normally work. Mm -hmm. And that's really the and that won an innovation award at the 
Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitats about uh, four years ago for uh, you know the innovative product that's going to help us push us to the next generation. Mm-hmm. And that's being used on, and I'm not working on the project, Adrian Smith here, another star architect here from, from town, uh, they're using Kone on that because of the ultra ropes and the ability to go past 2,000 feet. Do you think we'll get a 5,280-foot mile high building in our lifetimes? Our lifetimes, my lifetimes, maybe not, but (laughs) yeah, the technology is there. This year's Council for Tall Buildings and Urban Habitats uh, reward winner was for a new product called the FIT, which is produced by ThyssenKrupp right now. And and what it basically does is it goes way back to almost like a vertical highway where you have an elevator cab that and travels not only vertically but horizontally. So you can put multiple, and it does not have cables. It's, it's basically its own little motor inside of a giant uh, el, you know, electric motor. It's like if you took the motor components apart, you made the stator, the walls, and you made the rotor, the machine itself, or the actual cabin itself, this can operate independently. Kind of like the old days of the pattern oster, where you would walk on an elevator and you would have just a big belt or a, or a belt man lift. It's the same basic kind of a concept where you can have 10, 15 elevators in a hoistway acting independently. Wow. Yeah. And they're fi- they're they're filling in for each other from the side. It's right. like a video right. game. Exactly. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, the been told the first job has been sold. Uh, what we and we've been somewhat involved watching from the sidelines. And uh, one of the restraints is because it's not counterweighted. It's it's not as energy efficient as people would like it to be. So it, it's you've got you're doing all the work now. You have no no you know load on the other side to take some of this load off of the machine itself and the motor. So the motor's doing all the work now. All right. And it, it was basically like a five or six person cabin elevator and they've got these things running in in, in for in quarter scale in in germany already so all right well i'm going to ask you a dark dark web question because i've been fast fascinated in other podcasts with the idea of the app and internet world moving so fast with possibilities that they don't think of the end game of people who would want to be destructive with that is this a hacker's dream to get a hold of an elevator system where they could individually control and manipulate cabs in through a building? I don't want to say that it's a potential. It's a nightmare, but it's a potential. It could be. You could break in. There's a lot of radio frequency technology being used for elevators mm-hmm. right now where you can, with smartphones, you can now bypass the security systems and now have the tenant directly give you access credentials to your space that you want to go to. Right. I, well, I used to love changing the volume and the stations of the TVs at the <laughs> at the restaurants but before uh, that, that little thing got shut down. It's a lot like that. Um, the... Uh, for our commercial real estate listeners, there can be a real big difference as um, we tenant brokers are out there negotiating for positions on an elevator bank. I want to be at floor 30 because elevator bank one only goes up to elev- uh, to floor 29 so that when I catch that express, I'm the first stop after the ground. Uh it's something that, to be honest, sometimes it's something that I miss sometimes as I'm looking at the various buildings, uh, and and uh, some of my more experienced colleagues chastise me for that, and I, I kind of have to relearn my lesson. Is there is there a strategy there uh, that from from you as the elevator designer? Are you approached by the the uh, Adrian Smiths of the world that say our most important tenants? is going to go on floor 45, and they're going to have 45 through 48. So we got to make sure that this crossover floor doesn't happen before them, et cetera, et cetera. You'd see where I'm going. Every day. <laughs> every day. No, not every day. But no, there are certain tenants that they don't want to mix. Okay, I don't want my guys, you know, my lawyers mixing with the, you know, the, the computer salesman down the below. So with the destination dispatching, you can you can pretty much keep them separated, segregated in their own bank. Wow. So that smart elevator actually keeps businesses apart. I never mm. thought of that piece. I thought it was just about moving folks faster. I've got another project that will remain nameless because I've 
course, signed a non-disclosure agreement. But let's just say you've got a, a high-end residential building with a, a, a high level of service involved, and you need to have backup for the service elevator in case it's being used for a move or something. And you've also got some people that are very special that don't want to ride elevators with anybody else, especially other people that have dogs, for instance. Uh -huh, for instance. Uh, this destination system is very good for that because what it does is it discreetly and seamlessly assigns an elevator to the special person who spent you know, $18 million in their unit versus the guy that only spent nine. <clears throat> to allow them to ride by themselves without dogs or whatever. So, well, it's like a so it, it's like coded access. It sure is, but without the hey, you can't ride my elevator. Wow, that that's phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. In in the music industry, there was a very famous conductor uh, who's even his orchestra will go nameless who had his own elevator built for him, so he didn't have to share space with the m musicians yeah. and John Q. Public. Right. Uh, the the oldest elevator. Is is this the pyramids? Is this that that uh, weight counterweight technology? I mean, you must have studied the archaeology of elevators. Wow, there there have been lifts forever. I mean, since you know the beginning of time, when someone figured out hey, if I put a rope around something and I put it you know over the tree, and I can get some sort of mechanical advantage. There, there people have been lifting things, but until Elijah Otis at the World's Fair back in the eighteen hundreds. Did the demonstration where he cut the ropes and then the, the 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 safety device and the governor stopped the elevator in flight. Did elevators for the general public really become common? The Otis Elevator Building, a ten South LaSalle, a cool, cool project. Um, the um, some of our listeners are going to be uh, adaptive reuse. Small investors in real estate. Uh, I deal the, being a smaller uh, business, dealing with smaller clients. I deal with folks like this all the time. Uh, they they found the dream building for their showroom and their office. It was left behind by a previous user, maybe a warehouser. It's three stories, and it um, probably not a warehouser in this case uh, because it doesn't have an elevator. It's a walk up. If if uh, Mary Investor wants to take her building and get the best bang for her buck in this three-story and increase its value and get the best money for return. What would you advise her, advise her as one of the top uh, elevator consultants in the world? What would you tell her would get her her best nickel? I just did this yesterday, John. Okay, well, that's really good. <laughs> that's I'm good. glad you can deal with oh, no. Mary and her, her needs while you're no, dealing not, with uh, not everything's the architect. Not everything is a 90-story building. So, The first thing you have to look at is what is available within the building structurally-wise for you to work around. Ideally, if you've got some vacant space next to your building that you have access rights to, is to build a hoistway on the outside of the building for this three-stop elevator. And you okay. use either a hydraulic, holus hydraulic, and that's still the most economical cost is, is a holus hydraulic elevator. And you can get those to about four stories. So you're building a chaseway for you're more intents right. and purposes on the outside right. of the building. I've certainly seen those. Right. And then you are cutting into the skin of the building at each stop. And you've got then find access to a hallway. So there's a lot, a lot involved there. So it's, it's kind of a redesign of the building. Do you have a metric, uh, the way people buy grand pianos per, per foot, $9,000 sure. $9, nine per foot? Do you have a metric per floor that this is going to cost Mary for her three-story building? There's not a true metric of saying per floor, and a lot of even the general contractors, when they're starting to put together you know, a conceptual design budget, they use a, well, this should cost this much per stop. It, it, there's more to it than that. There's, mm -hmm. there's just the base cost of the equipment, and then there's a per floor ad that you can kind of work around. But, but Mary's probably going to spend, for a three-stop elevator, about $75,000 just elevator cost. Well, it's that's a lot, it, a lot lower than projects that that I've seen. Well, that's because the elevator portion is the cheapest part. So, okay. Yeah, it's cutting the hole, and that's why building the the the, the little 
hoistway on the outside of the building is the most economical way to do it. Structural engineers involved in otherwise you're pulling apart structure, you need to resupport floor slabs, and there's just a lot involved with that if you were to try and put it inside the building. Ideally, some of these old buildings had they were especially in Chicago and in, in, in the South, you know, Michigan Avenue area and down in the whole, you know, the old automobile district. Yes, uh, a lot of them had ele- big freight elevators or car elevators in there. So those those are natural places to drop elevators into. Is where there was an old freight elevator. Oh, of course, it, it's um, and you know it's kind of like that old joke, Ray, where you know you paid you paid me five hundred and ninety nine dollars to know where to hit the th- machine with the hammer and one dollar for the hammer stroke. Right. It's the pe- it's the it's the experts. It's the structural engineer. It's the it's the crew that you know, does the work. I, I'm, I'm very interested that, you know, that Mary was under $100,000 just in elevator costs. Um, uh, the project I'm working on, I worked on yesterday. Now, in their case, they had an existing elevator, but it was an old, you know, 1920s building. Yes. And when you weren't in a, you know, a big commercial area or something, they were basically moving telephone booths, and it had one. In that case, we... We're going to have to try and find a way to make their hoistway a little bit bigger. So now we start to cut holes and slabs and things. Like right. That. that becomes a challenge. I mean, that, that, yeah. that's, all, that's all math and, and, and engineering, and, and, and it's, we can figure out. But the problem is that building over the last 100 years is not perfectly straight up and down. And we can get a little bend. And I've worked on a few projects and that are, will go nameless, but have, you know, are of that same vintage that have shifted three inches over mm-hmm. 100 foot of travel in 100 years. So. Makes for a little crooked elevator, but the elevator doesn't care really. It'll it'll still go as long as it's got a straight path right. to travel. It doesn't have to be, you know, totally vertical. I love that illustration of moving a telephone booth. That's yeah. that's really that's really picturesque. Do you remember? Um, uh, my wife and I met at the Fine Arts Building, which I believe is the last, the last elevator that is operated by a human being. Is that correct? That's correct. And the guy that used to run it, Jimmy, was just a classic. He knew everybody. Yeah, and he he was uh, it was like having a CIA contact. Absolutely, he could he tell knew you everything. anything about what work. Um, our whole economy is going through this, Ray. Uh, and robotics are are going to absolutely eliminate jobs. Yet I'm trying to help young people being trained in robotics repair. We just actually placed our first person uh, into that program. Um, what was to talk about this little shift that happened when there used to be an elevator man? I, I that's what you know, people and and overnight, uh, seemingly overnight, we went to completely automated system. Talk right. about it. The problem was there were no brains involved in the elevators themselves, in terms of you know, how who do how do I send elevators to answer calls? Uh, there have been single elevators in buildings, you know, since the 1900s, really, where you can push up and down buttons. And as long as the, the system can figure out how to handle that, it's when you've got more than one elevator. Yes. Uh, that's where you would see the, the, the operators. Mm-hmm. And there was a thing that's still called to this day, I believe, well, we don't call it that anymore, but in the, in the 80s, we had a thing called the traffic director station. And there used to be a guy in a little hat that would sit down in the lobby and tell the guys where to go pick up calls. Oh, so he's like a, like a dispatch for a cab exactly, company. Exactly, exactly. Oh, I said, I didn't, I'm, I guess I'm just not quite old enough to remember that part of the technology. I certainly remember watching the sweep hand uh, across the elevators at the department store with my mother. right. In the 1940s and after World War II, we started to use computers and such to, and, and relay-based computers to make decisions and, and help you know, crack codes and such. Technology kind of made its way over to the elevator. So the first you know, large modernizations of changing these operator elevators to automatic was in the you know, late 40s, early 50s, and 60s. But it wasn't, I mean, it couldn't have been really been a computer. Was it a switching system it's with switching rheostats, system. Like, uh, almost like the old telephone system? The original dispatching was using the same basic function as the guys that were turning the crank on the elevator. You go from the bottom to the top floor, turn around and come back down, and you pick up, you drop people up on the way off, and you pick the ones that are waiting on the way down. And that was just called uh, terminal dispatch. And that was used really from, I'd say, 45 to about 63. 
And how did a machine replace a human doing that? What was the mechanical basis of that? Instead of the guy with the cap at the lobby saying, hey, pick up somebody on the 13th floor, Yes, is that the relay system recognized there was a down call there and it assigned one of the elevators that was traveling in that dis- direction to pick it up. Do you know the person who invented that little tech? Well, there's a lot of people that will, will take the credit for that, but uh, I, I don't, I don't want to. Uh, oh, that's fine. Yeah, so it's one of those. It's, it's just like the destination system. That, that concept has been around since 1963. It was you know, patented back then. It okay. never became an elevator reality until you know, the, the late 20th century. So. The, um, with some of these projects you're in in the Middle East, I'm really fascinated by how you deal with the temperature Outside, when, when you're looking at buildings that are getting in the sunlight 120, 130 degrees on the skin of the building, how do you deal with the 110-story building? Does it have any impact at all in the elevator, in the AC in the elevator, the fact that you're dealing with extreme differences in height up into the atmosphere, wind, and then temperatures that could fry an egg on the sidewalk? Luckily, everything's pretty much in a enclosed environment, so we don't really have to deal with too much. Uh, the whole structural engineering, and I was not involved with this project, but just looking at it and, and having traveled and been in it, the, the, the Burj Khalifa, that building is extremely tall. You go up to the 154th floor and um, you go into, just look at the bathroom, and not that I'm, you know, I just like to look at bathrooms. It's just you can tell if a building's swaying or not by looking in the toilets. The water swishing around, and and there's no movement. And we had like forty mile an hour winds outside. So, Bill, one of the best structure and engineers on the planet, uh, w- was involved with that, and uh, Chicago guy, and uh, of course Adrian was the main architect on it. And it really, uh, if you design it right, it it, uh, it it it's not an issue. But putting it up is a bear, and having been yeah. there and traveling there and, and seeing. Conditions and you work on, on jobs where uh, there's no, that isn't like you can call ComEd and people complain about ComEd. I'm glad we have ComEd because I've been on buildings that operate on generators, you know, after they've been opened and occupied for two years because the local co- company can't quite get the electrical hooked up. So, wow. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. So and it's you, a difficult environment to work in. Can you imagine? I mean, could you ever imagine this as this uh, farm kid from Iowa? That you would be in a job that took you to 154-story buildings in the Middle East. I mean, did you dream about the stars and going all, all over the world, or has this just uh, lapped up on your shores and you just go where you're sent? I wasn't worried about it much as a boy in Iowa. I just I was happy on my farm. I was happy uh, with all my friends and doing things. So I never thought I'd be here. No, a farm boy from Iowa now working on the world's tallest buildings is is. Uh, Quite a change. Uh, I miss the farm every now and then. Uh-huh. But there are days I just say, no, this is where I'm meant to be. So if you, uh, you probably don't do trips based on your job um, because that would be, you know, even more obnoxious to your family. But if you could take a, a tourist trip to see buildings, projects, and elevators, and you, you picked a city that's, <laughs> wow, this is the tech hub, this is the interesting hub, or maybe this has the most phenomenal lifts from you know the Medici period up to the, the current, where would you go? What's the elevator capital of the world? Or maybe we're in it right well, now. Well, you know, I'm, I love Chicago. There's no reason to go anywhere else, quite yeah. frankly, to me. And there's so much work and business here right now that I don't want to go anywhere else. Uh-huh. Technologies, you see them. I like to go to London. That's a good place to go anyway just because it's London. And you see some of the you know, different code, British code, that they follow. And uh, you see some of the more che- you know, the interesting technologies. Tyson has this thing called the twin where they put two elevators in the same hoistway. A lot of cables going around there. And I think Chicago has finally said, well, okay, we'll give you a, a chance to put something like this together. Mm-hmm. What that does is that gets away from the, the concept like we had at Aeon where – and uh, then the shuttle cars at Sears where the floor-to-floor heights have to be actual, absolutely the same height. Now you've got two elevators in inter- operating independently. But the problem with that is the lower elevator can never go to the top floor, and the top elevator can never go to the lowest floor sure. unless they, you build extra deep pits and extra tall buildings for these cars to hide into. And that's where that fit now, the thing that Tyson's also working on, is uh, comes over. Now the elevator just moves out of the way. 
Is there one building's elevator system that you've never gotten to see in person that you would just love to go see? Well, the Burj Khalifa was it, but then I was, I was working on a job for Jim over in uh, in Abu Dhabi, and I, I just grabbed the cab and went over and, and took a look at it. And I got a behind-the-scenes tour from a guy from Mount Prospect that, that really built it off for uh, EMAR. So it was like old home week working with a Chicago homie and, and, and uh and showing me, you know, the, the, the toilet on the 50, 154th floor and things uh -huh. like that that you wouldn't normally get to see. So. On the opposite side, is there an historic elevator that is world famous that you haven't ridden in, that you haven't gotten to see in person? I did not ride on the Apple elevator in Manhattan on Madison Avenue, but I saw it from the street. And, and what's great about that? Sorry, it's, I it's, don't it's know. round in a glass box, and it's just it's very minimalistic. And, and uh, we did... We didn't do, uh, we were involved with making sure we could pass inspection on the one on Michigan Avenue. And uh -huh. it's of the same kind of a, you know, foster out of the box kind of a thought process. But it's, uh, that's one I'd like to actually write on. You see, you do still have your architect roots. It's the aesthetic thing of it that, that, that you really like. Oh, we were touring, or we do a lot of work in Manhattan, and we were touring the old Woolworth building. And... Back and when that was built, it had the hoistways are smaller at the bottom and it acts like it's instead of a buffer, it was like an air buffer. But unfortunately, over the years, that has kind of gone away. But it was, it was an interesting concept. It would have been nice to be like a time traveler and gone back mm -hmm. in the 1920s and to ride some of these old historic elevators just to see what they were like. Well, I, I, I just have to bring up, Ray, that it's, a, it's a, a, a personal note that your hobby, the thing you teach, the thing you do on weekends is scuba diving <laughs> yes. you go below the surface that's, that's what right. you go down and 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 uh certainly didn't learn that on the farm did not did not that was a birth a christmas present laura wishes she never gave me i'm sure and i learned at the richport ymca in the grange and uh i don't do it as much as i'd like to because the market is just going crazy right now and i don't have much spare time and, right and the spare time i have is precious and i want to spend it with my family and and and, I, and my other my other hobby now is I like to go to Ravinia a lot and go to concerts. Yeah, so that, that's easier than all the gear you have to lift to become a scuba diver. But yeah, it's it's what I like about scuba diving is it's it's just the beauty of of everything that's underneath the water, whether it be a, a shipwreck from the 1800s in the Great Lakes to the coral reefs and in in, in in Tahiti or something. It's it's just it's 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 you just see the beauty. Mm -hmm. And there's no phones or internet. Yeah. And that's probably one of the reasons why it's not so popular right now is the kids can't, you know, get on their iPods underwater and, 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 and or their iPhones and, and check social media. Well, that's coming. <laughs> the, and what, what you say about the market being crazy is true. I, Karen and I were on a, a walk on Lake Michigan, and, I, and I've heard this is true in Toronto and New York and uh, other, you know, high development density cities. So we have, uh, is it 35 cranes visible right now? Yeah. High rise cranes when you're you're looking at the city of Chicago and um, John Zimmerman uh, just sent out a um, a newsletter where you can go to that uh, I think it's called Build Chicago uh, website. If you go to the uh, Willard Jones website, you'll see that they have it set up. Uh, it's astounding to see the not only the rapidity of the market but the quality and size of these projects. These aren't just a, a a bunch of cheap strip malls going up along an artery. These are major architectural accomplishment buildings. Yeah, Curb Chicago has a good uh, a uh, annual review, and the latest review they just did was you know the ten projects that will change Chicago skyline. Yes, and, and we're working on six out of ten. Oh, of congratulations! And uh, and there are fun projects with great people, and I'm, and, it's, and it's and it's just. Uh, just a testament of what Chicago can build, and what, what, we, what we're not afraid to to to, uh, to develop and, and to put up, and and it's uh, it's it's everything from office buildings to to residential and mm -hmm. and mixed use complexes, and there's a lot of really really interesting people and in, in, in buildings, and it's uh, going to keep me busy for a while. Go Ray Volk, uh, the person with one of the most strange jobs in the industry. It's a uh uh, privileged to interview on the, you on the professional side after knowing you as a friend. And um, it's uh, thanks for being on Stages to Success today. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Ray Volk from Jenkins and Huntington. 
a man whose job it is to take you to great heights. I'm your host, John Hunter, digital editing and technical assistance from Monty Scott, and recorded at the studios of Chicago Public Media at Navy Pier. Join us again for people and stories from the worlds of the symphony orchestra and commercial real estate for our next episode of Stages to Success.